We are continuing in our sermon series on the Acts of the Apostles, picking up where we left off two weeks ago, beginning today in chapter 4, verses 1 through 21. Hear now the word of the Lord. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot help from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now in our text today, we find Peter and John arrested after having made quite a scene by healing a lame man by the beautiful gate of the temple and then preaching about the resurrection. When the religious authorities asked them by what power or what name they did this, Peter said, by the name of Jesus, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Has there ever been a more provocative statement than that? Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, I pray now that you would pour your Holy Spirit through me, that these words might truly become your living word to your people. And I pray that you would open up each of our hearts and minds that we might receive that word exactly in the place that we need to hear it. For we pray this in the name of our risen and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, your word made flesh. Amen. There is no other name than Jesus was pretty bold of Peter, don't you think? Arrogant, even, to make such an exclusive claim about Jesus? I guess it all depends on, on who you think Jesus really is. And certainly there are plenty of opinions out there. 
I mean, some have said he was just a, a very good man or a great teacher or even a, a demigod, something partway between God and human. Others have said he was one particular instance of a God-infused person, an avatar, perhaps like some of the great leaders of other religions. But he certainly wasn't the unique incarnation of God, and therefore it is asserted we cannot make any exclusive definitive claims about Jesus. For there are few things that are more politically incorrect these days than making definitive truth claims, especially when it comes to religion. Now in our postmodern world, you cannot say that you have the truth about God, only a truth that works for you. You cannot claim to know the way to God, only a way that is no better than anyone else's. And you certainly cannot claim that Jesus Christ is the unique Lord of heaven and earth, only that he is a Lord whom you happen to find helpful in your quest for God. After all, it is often assumed we are all just climbing up different sides of the same mountain. I once read an example of this uh, in an article uh, by a man named Reza Aslan, a self-proclaimed Muslim and scholar of world religions. He writes, As someone who has spent the better part of the last two decades studying the world's religions, I know better than to take the truth claims of any religion, including my own, too seriously. After all, if there is a God, then that God is utterly beyond human comprehension. Religion is simply a framework for thinking about the existential questions we all struggle with as human beings. Can you have faith without religion? Of course. But as the Buddha said, if you want to strike water, you don't dig six one-foot wells, you dig one six-foot well. In other words, if you want to have a deep and meaningful faith experience, it helps, though it is by no means necessary, to have a language with which to do so. So then, pick a well. But I know, just as the Buddha did, that while my personal well may be different and unique, the water I draw from is the same water from, drawn from everyone else's wells. My goal is to demonstrate that while we may speak in different religions, we are more often than not often expressing the same faith. Now here we see some of these basic tenets of postmodern pluralism that what matters is a meaningful faith experience, regardless of whether there's anything real or true behind that experience. That God is fundamentally unknowable, if there even is a God. And that all religions are basically the same in the end. Therefore, none can make any exclusive claims about God or truth or salvation. And yet, did you notice that Mr. Aslan himself makes a definitive truth claim when he declares, without any evidence to support it, that the water he draws from is the same water drawn from everyone else's wells? But how does he know that? Just wanting something to be true doesn't make it so. Of course, one of the very understandable reasons for this perspective is that, as we all know far too well, religion has been the cause of an enormous amount of violence and hatred and suffering and division in our world. And in an effort to combat this, there has been an attempt to reduce all religions to their lowest common denominator, and then to say that they're basically all the same in the end hoping to minimize the conflict and division. The problem is, 
no true adherent of any religion would actually accept that claim. As New Testament scholar James Edwards writes, to assert that all religions are basically the same, or that one route up the summit is as good as another, is like saying that all sports are basically the same. Bullfighters and bowlers are unlikely to agree. Only a non-athlete can assert such a thing. And yet there are plenty of Christians out there who ascribe to views similar to this. As one former president of the Lutheran Church in India writes, Christ is the only way to the Father for Christians, but there are other ways for those who are sincere in other religions and of other convictions, for Jesus Christ is very inclusive in his spirit. In other words, sincerity is the path to salvation, regardless of what we actually believe. Or as another Christian scholar writes, when Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through me, what he meant was his disciples. For it is indeed through Jesus that Christians have access to their God. As if there's more than one living God out there. Something the faith of Israel was always very clear about. Of course, there's another very understandable reason for this attempt to minimize any exclusive religious claims about Jesus. I mean, for many of us, the idea that some people might be doomed to hell because they never got a chance to know about Jesus just doesn't seem right or fair. After all, we think if the gospel is not good news for all, then it is not good news at all, right? And so we reject any presentation of the Christian faith that seems to exclude much of the world from God's salvation, especially when we read things like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, or 1 Timothy 2, that God our Savior desires everyone to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, or 2 Corinthians 5, that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Of course, therein lies the crux of the matter. According to the witness of the New Testament and the faith of the church, in the person of Jesus Christ, God himself has come among us to reveal himself to us, to invite us to be a part of his kingdom and to offer us the gift of eternal life. See, part of the lies that we're often told about God is that as creatures, we cannot know our creator, if there even is one. Now, from a human perspective, this is entirely true. None of us can climb up the mountain to God. And there is perhaps no greater sign of our hubris as creatures than to think that our religious constructs could get us to the God of creation. But as the great theologian Leslie Newbigin has noted, we have assumed without any evidence to support it that religion, among all the activities of the human spirit, is the sphere of God's saving action. But none of us can capture God or, or know who God is or what God is like through our religious efforts. Now, if God really is God, then we are incapable of knowing him unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. And the Bible is the history of the self-revelation of the God who simply refuses to be God without us. Remember back in the book of Exodus when God called to Moses out of the burning bush and commissioned him to go back to Egypt to set his people free, Moses asked who should he say had sent him? God said, I am who I am. You tell them, I am 
has sent you. Then I am continued to reveal himself through the Torah, the law of Moses. Then I am spoke to the prophets and the psalmists and the rest of the writers of scripture continuing to reveal more of himself to his chosen people. Of course, they were not chosen just because they were so special or so they could revel in their good fortune. They were chosen so that they might be the means by which God revealed himself to the entire world. As God told Abraham, he would be blessed so that through him all the families of the earth might be blessed. Or as Isaiah told Israel, they were called to be a light to all the nations, including, as Jonah discovered to his dismay, the hated Assyrians whom God also loved. You see, they were never meant to keep the light to themselves because I am wanted all people to know him. But Israel was unable to fulfill her calling. But then one day, a young rabbi named Jesus came along saying some very provocative things. When talking to a, a Samaritan woman at a well and she said that the Messiah was coming, Jesus said, I am. When his disciples were terrified for their lives in the midst of a raging storm at sea, Jesus came walking to them on the water in the midst of the storm saying, do not be afraid, I am. When confronted with unbelieving Pharisees who clung to Abraham for salvation, Jesus said, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad, for before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He said, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters by me will be saved. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He said, I am the true vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though they die, will live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because Jesus is I am. As it said in Hebrews chapter 1, he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he upholds all things by his powerful word. Or as Paul writes in Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God, and all things in heaven and earth were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through the blood of his cross. You see, in Jesus Christ, God gets very personal and very specific. Be very sure when we look at the face of Jesus, we're seeing as much of God as we ever hope to see. For you can be sure Jesus was not just a great religious teacher or a moral example. He was not a, an avatar or a demigod, or even just a messenger from God. No, Jesus Christ is the God of creation come in the flesh because I am refuses to be God without us. And none of our religious heroics or convictions could lift us out of the abyss of our sin that separates all of us from God. Again, 
none of us can climb up the mountain to God, as if on our own we would even know which mountain to climb. So instead, I am came down the mountain to us, taking on our human flesh and conquering sin and death on the cross that we might share in his own eternal life. And he did it for the whole world because God desires everyone to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. You see, Jesus didn't come along to say that now no other religion can save us or that all other paths to God are now closed. No, apart from Jesus, there never was a path to God. No religion can save us, not even the Christian religion. Only Jesus can, because only Jesus is I am. As Peter said, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is why Jesus did not say, follow the Christian religion. No, he said, follow me. For in Christ, God came to free us from the power of sin and to enable a life-giving relationship with him that death has no power over, which is what salvation is all about. And Jesus did all the work. All we have to do is receive it as a free gift of grace. But God will never force anyone to be in a relationship with him. After all, you cannot make someone love you. And that is what the heart of God longs for above all else. That we all might know how much God loves us and that we might love God in return and experience the abundant life that Jesus was literally dying for us to have both now and for all eternity. And just as with ancient Israel, God has chosen some to be bearers of this incredible news that all people might enter into a relationship with him and become part of the new creation given birth to the resurrection of Jesus. And we are the ones who have been entrusted with this truth and sent out as his witnesses to shine the light of Christ into all the world's darkness, to be his instruments of reconciliation and peace. And our world could desperately use some peacemakers right about now. And yet so often we have kept that light to ourselves. So that there are still so many people who do not yet know about the love and the forgiveness and the salvation that we have in Jesus. And you can be very sure that breaks the heart of God far more than it breaks any of ours. This is why when it comes to people who, who do not yet know about Jesus or who have been turned off to Jesus because of his followers, I think that God is going to be far more just and far more wise and far more merciful and far more loving than any of us would be. And I believe that God's going to work things out in a way that will be far more perfect and far more surprising than any of us can even imagine. And who knows, maybe the atonement and the salvation accomplished by Jesus will reach further than any of us even dare to hope. Remember, in Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through the blood of his cross. And maybe... 
maybe that peace will reach across boundaries we never thought possible, bridging the divide between Christian and non-Christian, between Israeli and Palestinian, between Russian and Ukrainian, between life and death, maybe even between heaven and hell. You know, I, I think it's a hope worth holding on to, knowing that any salvation that occurs will still take place through the singular saving lordship of Jesus Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. But that means that you and I have work to do. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again so that we might receive the greatest gift that creation has ever been given, the Creator Himself. And you and I have been chosen to spread the good news that I am has come down the mountain to be with us and to make all things new, and that therefore, our hope is not found in our politics, thank God, or in our nation, or in our military, or in our money, or in our convictions, or in our sincerity, or even in our religion. No, our hope, the world's only hope, is found in Christ alone, in his resurrection, and in his grace. And it's free. All you have to do is receive it. And that, my friends, is news worth sharing. Amen.